So um, I guess you may have been to uh, some of the other workshops over the weekend, um, dealing with the kind of uh, nuts and bolts um, of uh, bookmaking, of portfolio making, and hopefully um, you've also had uh, a, some degree of inspiration. Um, so it's kind of maybe in a way sort of strange to consider narrative uh, last, actually, but um, I think that uh, hopefully narrative is, is a kind of lens uh, that's going to help you thread through all of the, um, the different techniques and approaches that you may have been exposed to um, from the workshops uh, over this weekend. Um, so generally, uh, I guess, how many people, most of you are third, uh, third year, is that right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, generally by the time that you graduate from GSAP, or which is soon, um, you, you will have had uh, six studios, four visual studies classes, uh, four tech electives, um, and presumably each class or studio actually exposed you to a very different approach towards architecture. And the MRC at GSAP doesn't have a thesis, uh, unlike some other schools, um, which can provide a kind of moment of synthesis. So hence, the portfolio is kind of seen as that, uh, that, that moment where everything comes together. Um, and in fact, um, as Enrique told me, uh, one measure of success um, pedagogically might have been that each of the studios you take in had nothing in common to do with the previous one. I don't know if, that was, I don't know if that's your experience. Uh, but um, I think that this was also um, a kind of idea uh, implicit in the new abstract that um, um, Yoon Jae presented on uh, Friday night, uh, seen here. In other words, that the GSAP is kind of a, your, your education here is kind of a container of a neutral container of kind of mixed parts, um, let's say, as she, as she described also the kind of formation and materiality of, uh, of this book itself. Um, I think you can tell that I prepared the presentation uh, on, in a very short time period since, uh, since Friday. So. Um, the, so the work you've done here and the material you've accumulated reflects um, a kind of diversity of viewpoints available at the school, or uh, perhaps even better, a kind of um, intellectual promiscuity on your behalf, if you will. Um, that's great, but I think it also uh, creates a kind of crisis, um, because at graduation um, you need to create this portfolio, it has to have a certain degree of clarity, it has to tell a story. Um, and the clarity comes precisely at the moment that it's actually too late to take advantage of it, right? So, and really the question is, I think, you know, what, what is your attitude towards architecture? Um, not just what have you, what classes have you taken here, what studios have you completed, um, but really what is your stake? Um, and to, to answer that question, uh, in fact, you need to um, gather your best ideas uh, retroactively, retrospectively. Um, and you need to articulate um, ideas that you may not ha have even been cognizant of during while you took the studios. Um, or perhaps you even need to kind of reinvent or reinterpret your past projects um, to see them uh, in a new light. So uh, all of this needs to be represented as a kind of cohesive whole. Um, and then furthermore, once you've developed that kind of clarity of thinking, you need to actually turn it into a physical, uh, a physical object. So that, that's kind of no small task. So that, that's how, um, basically that's how narrative uh, may serve you. So what is, uh, what do we mean by narrative? Um, well, I, of course, um, narrative is, is kind of uh, something that uh, one can think of in literature and fiction, right? Um, the um, a, a, a spoken or written account of connected events. Um, however, I think that the third, uh, the third definition here actually is perhaps uh, sort of more relevant to us, um, and uh, I think of in, in the context of, of your portfolio of a book as narrative is a connection of um, the act of connecting disconnected events together, i.e. A, a body of work you've done here. So, um, but is it also, I, I wonder, is it also just, is narrative simply a matter of kind of tying a thread, um, or is it, could it be something else? Um, and maybe just to kind of step back for a second, because I don't know, um, I know on Friday it was the, the kind of idea of the book in architecture was sort of generally discussed, but I don't know in the other workshops how much of a, how much of a kind of general discussion happened. Um, but, uh, and I was actually, um, 
uh, talking with uh, James Graham after on, on Friday night about um, you know this this idea that actually you know I'm kind of like part of the last uh, or maybe you two are part of the last generation that learned about architecture almost entirely through books rather than the internet. Um, and I actually found it I found it very refreshing that um, you know in this context typically one discusses the kind of death of the book right and. Everyone has to kind of affirm that, okay, the book is still important, et cetera. Actually, that I, I didn't hear that at all, in a way. Um, but I, th I do think that books are still important, and I think that um, for many architects, the book has been a kind of essential tool for clarifying, um, but also promoting their kind of ideas and projects. Um, and arguably, after building itself, the book could be considered the kind of second most important medium of intellectual discourse in architecture. So, you know, it's kind of no accident that um, someone like uh, Le Corbusier published uh, 35 books during his career. Um, and I, I think also that uh, books in architecture have uh, kind of certain, certain parallels as kind of creative practices. Um, both are sort of three-dimensional objects. They both have um, structure, rhythm, and hierarchy. Uh, you can move through a building and, or a book in a kind of linear or sort of prescribed way. Or, uh, or not. And um, so actually last, uh, last year, I, I'm not sure if it was part of the graphics project, but we had um, Rem Kolhas was here with the bookmaker, um, Erma Bohm. And um, he actually spoke about, um, of course, his time as a journalist and how he was um, also kind of like not only reporting, but actually working on sort of arranging uh, plates like prior to in the pre-press prior to when they would actually run the you know print the newspaper um, and basically arranging kind of headlines and leading stories on the front page um, and creating this he said that kind of creating this information on the front page was analogous to kind of composing a plan um, and I also have the same uh, sort of sense of a well-composed page of a book when I you know for instance when you look at the books um, by Lars Muller and you see the kind of balance of text, image, and sort of white space or void, um, I, I think that it's not indeed that dissimilar from a kind of well-composed uh, plan. Um, so I want to think of, I want to consider the book as um, not just a kind of receptacle, um, but a medium of discourse and also um, a creative practice. Um, and that um, how, how, you inf how you arrange information, how you edit, how you compose, and how you juxtapose all have the potential to create a kind of polemic or position um, through, through narrative. Um, and um, I think that there's, there's kind of like four ways of potentially doing this. Um, the first step is that uh, you have to pick what you're going to use, right? Um, you have to select the content, um, and you have to gather your best ideas, of course, and um, this is kind of the hardest part. Um, you'll, you, you may struggle with um, kind of omission or inclusion, um, which is no doubt uh, sort of weighed by your own memories or triumphs or traumas experienced at, at GSAP. You might, um, a, a certain image or a certain drawing might feel for you in a particular way because, for instance, your favorite critic you know, tore it off the wall during your review, or if I in, inversely, uh, that actually, I actually saw that last semester, um, or inversely, uh, you know, kind of praised it. And so in a way, I think you actually have to step outside of, you have to step outside your own experience um, to, to, in this editing process. Um, and you have to probably also ask your friends, someone you trust, to kind of look at it. Um, you have to, um, you have to create some distance, I think, to understand the value of the work and its possible positions within a kind of bigger narrative. And of course, um, don't, don't feel the need to include everything, I think is also the point in this portfolio, right? It's not, it's not just simply a record of everything you did here, a comprehensive record of everything you did here. Okay, but I'm not gonna talk about that too much. Um, and I think um, another topic that we could discuss is actually the kind of materiality of the book. And I don't know to what extent, was that actually really covered in a way through the other workshops? Um, so I, I'm not going to kind of get into this in, in great detail, but um, to kind of reiterate uh, what, what's been said before, I think that um, you have to consider the book as an object um, through its, an object through its, um, through its cover, through its paperweight, through its texture, its binding, um, can all contribute to its kind of look and feel, but also its meaning. 
Um, something like a larger format or a kind of art monograph would have um, thick paper, a kind of hardcover cloth binding, and it would imbue your work with a certain kind of weight, permanence, or significance. Um, a soft cover uh, or paperback might be more accessible uh, versus something um, in between, you know, along the lines of like the, these books that um, Stephen Hall made, uh, Anchoring, Intertwining, which are like, they have a kind of cloth cover, but they're actually, uh, they're, you can actually bend them. It's kind of beautiful, uh, beautiful treatment. Um, or, you know, perhaps something totally different, um, like, a, um, like a kind of uh, annual report which would present a kind of object, objective and statistical synopsis of, of performance, uh, or even a kind of magazine which has um, a thin, and, thin and glossy pages that um, take, on, take on the ink in a way that's saturated and, you know, would support a kind of sensational images or kind of advertising. So these are all different... Um, in a way, kind of uh, typologies of, of, of books that um, you can consider as templates to start with. Um, and uh, my advice is also to make a kind of dummy. Um, and actually, this is a, what's on the screen now is um, a kind of book about books uh, from a book designer. And he's kind of, um, uh, in this book, actually kind of systematically dissected all the components of, of all the books he's made, or the first hundred books that he made you know, through, through, for instance, binding, this is like kind of almost uh, showing you the sort of variety of different techniques that one, one can employ. Um, and uh, actually also as a kind of story, my, a lot of my experience um, in bookmaking, um, which is, I, I'm sort of an amateur in a way, but I, I uh, had the opportunity to work with Irma Bohm um, on presentation books that we made at uh, OMA. Um, we made books for every project, and now in my own practice, uh, we also make books for every project. Um, at Irma's uh, house, which is also her studio in Amsterdam, um, she has like this bookshelf of like blank, basically blank dummies. Um, every book she's ever made, like like thousands, um, and they're all white, of course, because it's just like uh, it's just like the kind of paper, um, the binding, the spine, the cover, etc. Um, but there's kind of like also every conceivable variation, like like this sort of grid. Um, and what I, what I found incredible was that actually each book already takes on its own kind of character and identity before before it even receives any kind of information or prints on it. Um, so I think being conscious of the book as an object, as I said, as a kind of 3D thing, as a material thing, is uh, has to be also kind of a starting point for narrative. Um, again, format, layout, typography, color. Uh, these are all, you've heard a lot about this this weekend, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, cover it again, but I think that the important point again is that it's um, in the service, in the service of some kind of overall story. And what I will actually um, kind of elaborate on now uh, are two ways in which you can, you can generate a kind of structure, or two tools for uh, generating structure in, in the process of bookmaking. Um, this is what I want to focus on. So. Um, the grid and the kind of list. Um, so this was Glenn on, on Friday, um, and he was talking about um, The Art of Inequality, uh, the new publication um, from the Buell Center, uh, mirroring uh, this report from the 70s, the Kerner Report, which asked the question, what's happening, why is it happening, and how is it happening? And by looking at all the pages together in a grid, uh, one can see that there is a kind of tripartite structure uh, of the book that actually follows the overall the overall kind of narrative here, um, and this is the same uh, designer Joost Grotens who I showed earlier, um, who uh, has a kind of simplified version of the same thing. It's actually several different books that uh, he designs, but uh, you can see that there are they are sort of simplified diagrams uh, of the books indicating um, the type of content, i.e. Is it, is it a map, is it text, is it an image? Um, indicating the format of it. Um, the, I think each, this is like 18, 19, these are each different books. Um, and uh, the page numbers, the formats, the, the arrangements, um, how the text falls on it, uh, the ink, right? You don't always have to use, e even though one can use for process ink all the time easily, doesn't mean you have to. Um, and then also the kind of paper type. And wh also what's interesting here is I think that this, 
uh, these kind of diagrams of books um, also sort of show that, you know, there's, for instance, the, the Prix de Rome book, um, there's one section here uh, at the beginning, which is um, uh, on the left side, verso text, on the right side, the recto, the image. Um, and then there's actually a series of sections following that with a two page, with a single spread showing text, um, and then a series of full spreads showing images. And there's actually eight, eight signatures or sets within the book of this, this happening. So there's a kind of repetition, if you can imagine. So I think even kind of sketching out for yourself um, how this works will help you uh, kind of conceive, uh, conceive of um, a kind of overall structure. And actually, if you take, um, if you listen to only one thing I say, I would suggest you do this. Um, I think that uh, InDesign actually promotes a kind of myopic view of bookmaking. Um, it's critical to actually see everything together. Um, this is a book that I made. Um, and um, I, what I did was print it out and pin it up in my living room. Um, it's actually only, it's only half of the book uh, because this was the only wall in the living room. It was pretty small. So if you don't have enough space at home, then print it at 50% and get, get the overview. Um, and I think what, what you can see here, when you see everything together, you can understand speed, rhythm, Repetition and breaks, in other words, you know, how the narrative uh, unfolds through the entire book. Um, and at this moment, I mean, to, to give you a kind of specific example, we really realized that um, together with the two co-authors, you know, we realized that we needed to kind of um, inject uh, pauses between each of the major sections. We needed to um, differentiate the beginning section um, in, terms of this, in terms of the scale of the information in it from the rest of the maps that appeared in the other part of the book. So we introduced kind of full spread images in the beginning. And, and so I think it's, it's in a kind of, um, although this was an earlier iteration, I think it was um, an extremely useful tool. And the grid is almost like, uh, you know, seeing the book's pages as one might see um, kind of frames in a film. Um, and so actually this is, a, this, is a, this is a film, a representation of a film. I think it's like one, one minute per line. Um, but I think that, uh, it um, can also help us think about a book as well. Um, and particularly where you have uh, more space or more time to kind of elaborate a single project, um, I would really encourage you to, to take a kind of cinematic stance towards the book. Um, this was like definitely an attitude that, um, that, that I sort of learned uh, also making books at OMA, um, that one can actually through the pages of the book, you can, you can pan across a building, you can zoom into something, uh, you can create montage, and all of this type of movement can be implied uh, moving from kind of page to page. Um, and so uh, the book is indeed um, a kind of way to present movement or journey um, through a space. Alternatively, you can also take in a book you know, a fixed position and demonstrate uh, the kind of mutability of contents or, or program in, inside of a plan, inside of an image, et cetera. Um, so again, that, that sort of sequence allows one to, to construct um, these types of implied, uh, implied movement. Um, so that's technique number one, the grid. Um, the second technique that um, I would uh, encourage you to use is um, the table of contents or, or a kind of list. And actually, um, I think often this is like something that, that is uh, like this lecture, it's kind of easy to do last, but um, I think it's important to uh, perhaps do it proactively um, and start with start with a kind of table of contents as a structure, um, a device to kind of structure and sequence your book, but also to kind of build this narrative. And and what I actually want to do, I'm kind of inheriting um, the what the the presentation that Enrique Walker has given in the past, is actually look at um, several uh, architectural monographs through the table of contents. And I have um, actually five, uh, five books to, uh, to show you, which I noticed curiously were all published between um, 1994 and 1998. And I don't know why that is, but I think that it was probably a very kind of rich moment in bookmaking, right? The book was, I mean, that was kind of the genesis of the World Wide Web, and people were thinking about um, information in a whole new way. Um, the ability to kind of jump and to link and to create more uh, sort of three-dimensional spaces of information. Um, and, I, and I think correspondingly there was kind of an, a sort of whole series of books 
that, were, that took place and that were made at that point uh, kind of responding to that. Um, or it's just a coincidence that all the books come from then. But, uh, so uh, the first monograph is actually the um, Herzog and Demeron monograph, um, or actually uh, uh, the first thing to say, it's actually a four volume set, right? And um, I've been talking about your kind of portfolio, but that doesn't mean that it has to exist as a single volume. Um, and this monograph uh, published in 1996, well, the first, the first two parts, I think part number two came before part number one. I don't know why, but th those first two parts were published in 96. And then um, I guess three and four were published um, after the dates that are on them. Um, the colors on the cover were actually designed um, by the artist um, Remy Zaug, who, who uh, Herzog and Demeron collaborated with. Uh, before his death. Um, they uh, interestingly also collaborate with artists when they use color in their projects. So the decision to um, apply that thinking into the book is, is relevant, of course. Um, this is the first book. I don't, I don't know if you can see this kind of the quality of the sort of pink on pink, un unusual kind of pink on blue. Um, but mostly what I want to talk about is the, the sort of um, how the projects are arranged. And here, um, as I said, I think it's a very, it is a very traditional monograph. Um, the projects are all numbered. Um, they're presented uh, chronologically. Um, here they present uh, 20 projects out of 47 that they did in the first, um, in the first 10 years. So they were doing like, like five projects a year. So taking two studios a year will be the slowest pace you ever work at, uh, hopefully, in your careers. Um, and um, I, I think what's interesting is that uh, Number one, they don't show 60% of the work, right? 60% of the projects are omitted for reasons we, will, we don't know why, but presumably a kind of process of editing. Um, and, and also their, their kind of method of, of labeling or numbering, I think, um, is, uh, conveys a certain kind of treatment of the work, systematic or kind of hierarchical treatment of the work. Um, and then the next two, the, actually this is volume, this is volume one, this is volume three, and this is volume four, which changes slightly in appearance, but not in format. Um, by the end, the, over the next 10 years, then they do another 150 projects as they kind of accelerate. And you can see that the project labeling extends um, through all four volumes. So they, and what's interesting also is by the time they get to the fourth volume, um, they've assigned every object in representation a kind of code, as if they're uh, sort of representation uh, specimens in a museum, right? And in the back, you can see the image credits. They have this kind of incredible um, sort of taxonomy or or index, let's say, of of every every kind of graphic artifact. Um, and I, I think that that actually reflects their the kind of operation and attitude um, of their office, the systematic and hierarchical kind of Swiss office that's nonetheless um, sort of cultivated a broad repertoire of work, um, but, but uses this sort of system to, to, to package it. Um, uh, the second uh, monograph is um, by Peter Zumthor, which was published um, a couple of years later, to, uh, 1998, um, by um, Lars Muller, who's really like, you know, kind of a master of, of, of bookmaking. Um, and it is also, I think, a very beautiful uh, kind of artifact. It's, it's set, the typeface is a kind of accidents grotesque, which is, you know, this typeface that came before Helvetica. Um, very, very classical. And, and so what is he trying to do here? Well, actually, um, in his, uh, Zumthor in the introduction talks about, um, for him, the kind of influence of place. Uh, referencing Heidegger, talking about um, the importance of location, atmosphere, and material. And for him, ultimately, what's important is the kind of presence of his built work um, in the world. I mean, this is a story that he, this is his story. Um, we don't have to, we don't have to accept it, but I think um, what's, what's important to know is that he's also using the format and the narrative of the book to kind of reinforce that position, let's say. Um, so, of course, it's logical that the book is split into two parts, one part uh, being uh, buildings, uh, which are realized, and then the second part being uh, projects, which are unrealized. Um, there's two categories, each with their own chronology, and although the project, the project typically comes before the building, it's, it's inverted here because, for him, the built reality is, is more important. 
Um, in the first part, the projects are primarily represented through the photographs of Helene Pinier. Um, actually, a single photographer was entrusted to the entire portfolio of built work, so there's almost nothing else other than uh, these kind of images um, showing the projects, and, and um, they show the projects in their location. They show it, um, you know, with the kind of with the Swiss mountains behind. Um, they show the projects in use, um, and they emphasize again that that notion of kind of being in place. Um, the second half of the book uh, takes on a very different format, um, in which um, drawing and models are uh, the primary the primary form of representation. And so again, I, I do think that that's, that that structure that um, that kind of um, format for the book reinforces um, Zumthor's narrative. Um, Okay, the third book uh, published in 1995, I think um, everyone is probably familiar with. Um, it's actually a very different kind of monograph. Um, it's epic, it's uh, 1,344 pages. Um, as you know, it's not, it's not organized chronologically, but rather by scale. Um, and in the introduction, um, uh, Rem writes that actually, you know, the coherence, he, he says that coherence imposed on an architect's work is either cosmetic or the result of self-censorship. Um, so presumably, Peter Zumthor was exercising a, a, a significant degree of self-censorship in order to kind of deliver such a, such a kind of clarified um, and, and uh, consistent um, storytelling of, of his work. Uh, which is not to say that it's wrong, but um, for Rem, the architect, um, architects depend on the kind of provocations of their clients, whether they're institutional or uh, individual. And he says that incoherence, or more precisely randomness, is the underlying structure of all architects' careers. I, I think that's, I do believe that's more or less true. Um, and architects are confronted with a kind of arbitrary sequence of demands parameters in which they did not establish and, and operate in countries they hardly know. And so uh, with that, f from that kind of argument or from that position, um, SMLS XL, uh, which is done, of course, uh, is a collaboration, of course, with Bruce Mao, who's credited um, in the, as having authorship over the project as well. Um, it's organized according to size, and there's no connective tissue in the book other than that. Uh, writings are embedded between projects, um, not, to, not, not to provide the kind of cement, but rather as uh, sort of autonomous episodes, and contradictions are embraced, and the book, in fact, the book can be read in any way, right? Um, so he's also saying that uh, in a way, and, and so what you see here, of course, there's a kind of glossary um, that weaves through the book that's shown on the left here, like alphabetically through the whole book in a kind of single column, um, through each of the cha through each of the kind of um, scenes, let's say SML XL, um, and uh, I think also the, the the another kind of underlying argument is that um, in a way program uh, architecture can no longer prescribe program that scale may be our only ability to kind of understand so. Uh, significantly, I think in this, yeah, here on, on page 494, he writes about, of course, the Manifesto of Bigness, um, which erodes the distinction between architecture and urbanism, and calls bigness a kind of manifesto, essentially a, a, um, a manifesto uh, of scale, that the size of the building in lo the size of the building alone embodies a kind of ideological program. Um, and I think the other thing that, that's kind of important to say um, about this book too is that um, there's a whole series of, of kind of, in addition to the glossary, there's a whole series of kind of layerings throughout the book. Um, there's also all kinds of like everyday objects um, inserted into the book, uh, newspaper clippings, images of, um, images of Michelangelo sculptures and frescoes, airport plans, pornography, uh, paintings by Gerhard Richter, Mondrian, advertisements, et cetera. Uh, interspersed throughout, um, there's uh, cartoons, there's also um, uh, drawings with the kind of handwritten annotations on top as well. Uh, even, even kind of graphs uh, of expenditures of the office, right? So um, 
I, and I think that the, um, the intent is, of course, to kind of expose the conditions under which architecture is produced. Um, and it, and it, as a book, it seems quite radical to kind of have all of this, although I think that um, I would actually say that um, uh, one finds a kind of earlier iteration of it in uh, Corbusier's, uh, Le Corbusier's Towards a New Architecture. He also took, you know, in, in the 20s, being influenced by the kind of Dadaists, took these everyday images and just kind of put them in his book as, as sort of reference. So uh, the results, I would say, of SML XL is um, a uh, kind of monumental variegated um, accumulation of, of stuff, basically. And uh, to kind of reiterate, that is, I think that um, that, that structure, that narrative is um, attempting to kind of reinforce uh, some of the OMA's underlying ideas about, about what architecture is. Um, okay, uh, book number four is uh, Bernard Schumi's Event Cities, uh, written in 1994. It's interesting, I think it was actually produced entirely uh, internally in his, in his own office rather than um, working with uh, a kind of collaborator outside. As I, as I mentioned, the last few books are kind of photographers. Um, Shumi's intent with Event Cities uh, was to reconcile, um, on the one hand, the kind of theoretical text on architecture that he had written before this, um, and that was, um, I think, very prominent in architecture um, in, under postmodernism in the 70s and 80s, with the kind of superficial, glossy picture books of built work, right? So he wanted to find a kind of middle, middle ground, um, and coming on the heels of postmodernism and, and um, through his book, uh, suggest a kind of realignment, um, a realignment away from autonomy and back towards practice. Um, so the book, if I recall correctly, um, actually it doesn't, it's, it's black and white. There are no glossy pictures in it. Um, and it's organized, um, it's organized into, uh, it's organized more or less chronologically in four, in four sections. I think there's one exception, the, uh, the third project in there, but, um, I think that also there's there's kind of like three um, there's kind of three main points here um, that he was seeking to achieve. Number one, um, as I mentioned, kind of practice is a sort of form of theoretical discourse. It's interesting out of 621 pages that only three are dedicated to kind of a standalone essay here. Um, there's text, of course, elsewhere in the book, but the emphasis is on the projects themselves. Um, one, one encounters, in this book, one encounters like sometimes 20 or 30 pages of like plans, sections, um, et cetera, and what Shumi calls obscene details because of the realism of their joints, screws, um, bolts, and other elements called out by their real names. Um, the second, um, so the, in other words, he was including that, those kind of, that kind of information because he wanted to, um, wanted to advance his kind of position of, or his Praxis, literally. So, the second point I think is a kind of um, uh, the importance of cities and the engagement with the city. Um, and he says that in each project in the book, um, each project developed in this book, there's a history of the city. The city, as its object, is presented here um, as synonymous with architecture. The subject is always the kind of urban effect. And there is no architecture without the city, and no city without architecture. Um, and certainly, that that kind of lends. Um, the names of these different categories, uh, planning strategies, architectural urbanism, urban architecture, et cetera. Um, the third point um, is, I think, uh, his idea of the kind of events or event. Um, and that there, is, there can be no architecture without action or event, um, which is, of course, as well, um, a new idea about program that came about in the mid-90s as a critique of the kind of modernist idea of a relationship between form and function. Um, cities being the events where uh, places cluster, uh, cities being the places where events cluster. Um, and of course, in this book, you can see events, events has its own category, um, but it also, it also kind of provides a filter for how other information is kind of selected or, or um, filtered. So, you know, you could say that probably, um, that probably uh, Parc de la Villette is sort of the most well-known 
uh, project of Shumi's um, at this point. Um, he won you know, this huge competition with like 500 people in it. Um, and he built it, I think, at this point. Um, and interestingly, he doesn't present Parc de la Villette in this book. He, what he presents are, um, he presents a kind of event of the opening, um, fireworks, uh, that, that, were, that were designed and were actually um, unfolded along this kind of diagram of points, lines, and surfaces, which was also the sort of design for the park itself. So it's interesting that he shows, he shows rather than showing the kind of designed artifact or the pictures of the follies completed in the landscape, he shows actually um, a kind of event that they designed, which is then sort of turned into a series of diagrams. Um, Okay, uh, the fifth book that I want to show is um, a monograph from um, 2004. No, it's from, I think it was first published in 19, uh, 1994. Um, an earlier edition, I think, was published um, then. And um, I might be wrong, actually, but I think it is, I think it must be from 1994. Anyways, um, this book uh, is actually designed by one of the other, the, person I showed you earlier, um, Jos Grotens, as well. Um, and this book uh, is uh, not chronological. Uh, it's not arranged by scale. Um, and it's not, um, in the words of the authors, an all-embracing survey of their work. Um, the authors state that um, it's actually a reconstruction of their work, is also something that uh, you will do in the process of making a portfolio. And as they describe it, a kind of travel report on their uh, journey through architecture, all the things that, in other words, it's not, it's not about when they, left, when they left port on the ship and it's not about when they arrived at their destination, but actually, um, you know, all the, all the shit that happened in between. Um, the, the book is organized around uh, 16, 16 issues and themes which have consequences in their work. Um, but are also their own uh, preoccupations, obsessions, and desires, um, which is certainly, I think, a valuable lens for you, for you to consider uh, your own work. Um, and as such, uh, what's interesting, and so you can see basically what they do is they have, um, they have uh, this kind of introduction to each of the sections. Um, they sort of describe what it is um, on, the, on the right side, on the bottom left side, um, they give some kind of instructions for like how to achieve this. Try to forget that the design is already there. Think up forms that could give us new meanings. Develop a range of associations that enrich or contradict the design, et cetera. Um, so that, that's how they approach scenario. Um, texture. And so anyways, there's 16 of these kind of themes. And then within each theme, um, there's always a kind of structure for uh, verso and recto in, in the book. There's uh, often, for instance, on the left, one sees the parts. On the right, one sees the whole. On the left, one sees the diagrams. On the right, one sees the photographs. On the left, one sees the site plan. And on the right, one sees the kind of building plan. Um, this also sets up a kind of dialogue or discussion. Um, and, and because each section has its own structure, it serves to kind of differentiate and explicate uh, the different, their, their different preoccupations. Um, finally, the last few pages of every section uh, have like detail, have kind of images of the realized work as an example of that theme. Um, and what's interesting is that um, actually the, uh, and then the sections are separated by like an uncoated kind of black paper and white, which, which contrasts with the kind of full color um, in between. So what's interesting is that the projects appear more than once in the book, right? So you first perhaps encounter uh, one of their projects within the kind of sculpture section, and then you encounter it again in texture. And that allows you to actually also kind of see different aspects of, of the same project, um, which I think is quite, um, quite unusual and sort of inventive. Um, and that's, so here, for instance, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but um, basically like the, the projects are listed and then you can see it's, it's kind of a set of occurrences um, throughout the book. Um, so basically that's, uh, you know, those are uh, five different approaches to how to, how to structure a uh, kind of narrative, um, approaches to organization. Um, 
I think I hope that you kind of uh, see that you know in a way um, when you when you try to set out and create an argument that that all of these uh, kind of tools can be in service of that um, and ultimately the portfolio is to kind of help you uh, organize the past um, from the clarity of the present um, but I think that uh, more importantly and as you stop and kind of think about what you've done uh, to hopefully enable you to um, look forward in a new way. Thank you.